Okay, I'm so excited. So, hi, welcome to Tips Vlogs. Today, we, I should turn the light on, hold on. I don't really need it, but I feel like it may help. It's probably no difference. Oh, it looks a little better. Okay, so, oh my God. Okay, I'm excited because this is the first um, official Bible study that I'm posting on the vlog, and it's been a long time coming. This is something that I feel like God has been leading me to do for a while and just even talking to some friends, accountability partners, like, you know, setting goals for the month, I realized one of the main things I want to do with the vlog, I have not done yet. And so this is me doing that, being um, obedient and doing what God has told me to do. So, so today's vlog, or I want to actually do a vlog series about the fr fruit of the spirit. Okay. Fruit of the spirit. Um, <laughs> we, I've been studying this for a while and it's 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 really good and so all that but first i just want to just i'm so grateful and thankful to be here and I'm, let me just pray lord i thank you so much for what you're doing in my life father god i thank you that we have come to this moment together lord and i thank you for the words that um you will share through me for just the increasing of the kingdom lord i pray that your will be done in jesus name amen okay i'm excited all right so first of all fruits of the spirit what are the fruits of the spirit um galatians 5 and 22 says the fruits of the spirit are love joy peace forbearance which is patience long suffering um kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control and so this um we actually had wings and worship last night it was our first official one but it's kind of second one we did it before but this is our first official wings and worship um session that we had at wingstop and it was a bible study that we talked about fruits of the spirit and kind of before we get into all of that, the very first thing that I started off with was, um, and actually I heard a sermon that kind of spoke about this. So the last thing that Jesus said before he, you know, ascended up into heaven was Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the, um, the commission, the great commission. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in all nations. Like basically be a disciple and make disciples. And so it's like, well, what is a disciple? Um, you know, how, what does that mean? It sounds fancy. Well, a disciple is simply... A follower of Jesus someone who learns from Jesus and wants to be like Jesus and and molds their life to um, submit to the Lord basically and so I feel like as you're trying to figure out what a disciple is and be that if you're a follower of Christ if you want to you know mold your life after him you have to understand okay well, what is a disciple what does a disciple look like what are they supposed to do and so that's where we get to fruit of the Spirit um, and that scripture is I believe it's John 15, 1 through 8. So the whole thing is 1 through 8 is the is the the kind of the meat of what I'll be talking about. But let me find my notes because I have several notes on this. And I think the notes from Bible study is where I highlight it where, um, where this came out. So basically it says, You will know them by their fruits. These are my true disciples. Okay, let's get into the let's get into John fifteen one three. This is the the cusp of what I want to say because that's in Matthew, um, seven. That's what I was trying to find Matthew seven fifteen um, through twenty talks about you will know them by their fruit. And these are my true disciples. So basically, Jesus is saying a disciple is somebody who is easily identified by fruit. Okay, well, what is fruit? There's different types of fruit, um, but the ones we're going to focus on in this Bible study particularly is the fruit of the spirit, the one that I read in Galatians 5 and 22 and 23. And before we can kind of get in that, we need to understand, I think, the the essence of where fruit comes from. Like, how, what's the source, right? What's the source? Okay, so um, John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And this is the NIV version. So some other versions say vine presser, vine dresser, husbandman, like basically the the one who tends the garden. So Jesus is the vine and God is his father is the the vine dresser, the one who, you know, does what needs to be do and done. And we'll get to that in some other verses. But basically true vine, um at during that time, Israel was referred to as the vine of Egypt, I believe, and, well, not I believe, I'm pretty sure it was the vine of Egypt, but basically Israel was just referred to as the vine, kind of in some studies that I saw, and the vine, like, that was their name, it's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think, just like, if, like, if you had a group of people and they have, like, a nickname that they go by, like, oh, that's that crew or whatever, like, Israel was the vine, like, that's what they, that's what they were called, and there's several other scriptures that refer to this, Psalm 80 and 8, um, 
and Isaiah 5 also both talk about um, vines. And so Jesus was like, I'm the true vine. Like, y'all think y'all the vine, but I'm the true vine. And I find that kind of funny. I, when I read the Bible, this is the side note. When I read the Bible, I find a lot of things funny slash petty. And so I might be laughing throughout this Bible study series, but that's fine. Okay, so um, also what else I want to say about this scripture? Oh, yeah, I read that. I mentioned Psalm 80 and 8 and then Isaiah 5 and 1. Okay, so verse 2 says, He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. Hmm, okay, what does this mean? When I read this, to me it meant that there's something that's going to happen regardless. Either you're being cut off or you're being pruned. Both of those processes don't sound too great, right? Like, being cut off if you're not bearing fruit. And there was there's a scripture where Jesus cursed a fig tree. They were walking by, and he saw the fig tree, and he didn't have no figs on it. And Jesus was like, pretty much cursed the tree down, and it wasn't there. Um, and it's like, anything that does not bear fruit is getting cut off, okay? And that's, that's, that's what this says. And then every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it will be even more fruitful. And that's that's kind of interesting like to me i felt like you just i don't know who t i don't know why i thought when i guess i became a christian that life was going to be easy or things would be great or that you know it was just going to be roses but it's not like you there's still a pruning process and sometimes that doesn't feel good like think about pruning an actual plant something is being cut by sharp shears but what, what it says later on in the verse is that so that it will be even more fruitful that means that it may not feel good, but it's for a reason. It's for a purpose, and that purpose is to be more fruitful and to grow. So when you think about like pruning a tree, um, if you don't prune it, it will just kind of stay at a certain level. It'll be the growth will mostly be stunted, and it won't grow up. It will kind of grow out a little bit, but that's it. But like when you have a tree that's growing, you cut off some of the the younger baby limbs. I'm not a gardener, <laughs> but you cut off some of the smaller limbs, and then it it foc the focus focuses on growing upwards instead of outward into those limbs. It's like those other limbs aren't going to pull from the source or the energy or like, you know, the water. It's not going to suck up anything else that's not needed because those limbs are cut off and it's pruned so that the, the tree or the plant could grow up higher, stronger, have a stronger base around the trunk of it, and then grow up to be a thicker, fuller tree. And so that's what that means. Um, and some kind of some definitions basically cuts off when it says he cuts off every branch basically means like to purge or purify or get rid of undesirables. Um, the branch is just the connection point to the source. So Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And then the fruit are the things that come from us. And basically bear means to carry or to support something. <clears throat> so let's see. I think that's it for that um, scripture. Oh, this is a note that I had. So it's possible to be in Jesus. This is the note that I realized just kind of reflecting on this. It's possible to be in Jesus and connected to the source, but still have some things that need to be cut off. So I believe that's true no matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you're in, what season you're in. You can be connected to the Lord and still need some stuff cut off of your life or pruned, I should say. And so that was kind of deep. It made me. It made me realize what are some things in my own personal life that need to be that Jesus is trying to cut off that I'm trying to hold on to. And um, thank God that I'm submitting to the Lord. <laughs> okay, so verse three says, "You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you." And I was wondering, like, okay, so the first two verses say, "I'm the vine, my Father is the gardener." And then it says, "He cuts off every branch in me that is not fruit, that doesn't bear any fruit, and every branch that does." Um, bear fruit he prunes it so you know first two verses kind of related talking about fruit talking about pruning and things that are related to that and then verse three is like you are already clean because of the word i have spoken to you and i was like lord why did you put this here um why do we need to know that we are clean like what made you decide to say this part in this particular piece because even the verses after this that we'll read they're all kind of kind of i feel like have the same thing but this was like slid in there like verse three slid in and then, and I realized that this was here because of the verse that comes after that. Um, verse 4 says, remain in me. And I'll read the rest, but let me stop right there. Remain in me. I think in order for us to 
remain in Jesus, we need to know that we're clean. Um, Isaiah, there's a scripture in Isaiah where um, he talks about, I saw the Lord and I thought to myself, woe as to me, I'm a man of unclean lips. It's like when you're remaining in Jesus and when you're following him, you often will see a lot of, if you're doing it right, <laughs> you'll see a lot of times things that need to be cleaned or things that need to be renewed or things that need to be just submitted to God because as we're trying to be holy as he is holy, the fleshly side of us is dying. We're dying to our flesh. And so I feel like God was like, let me put this in here so let them know because I'm about to tell them to remain in me and they need to stick to me and abide in me. But before they can do that, they need to know that they're already clean. That they're already, if you have been saved, if you have submitted your life to Christ, you are clean. And it says, verse 3, you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So this thing has already happened. You've already received it. Remember that. You're going to need to walk in that because I'm about to ask you to remain in me. And so um, for all the super saved folks, this is your shout moment right here. You missed your shout. <laughs> because this is the good news right here. We're already clean. We're already saved. And we're just trying to walk this thing out. We're trying to go from being... Um, this is also a part of a sermon that I heard um, from Transformation Church. Actually, it's really good. But from going from being a no fruit follower to a some fruit follower to a more fruit follower and then a much fruit follower. So those all those steps, you kind of have to go through some things. And one of those things is remaining or abiding in the Lord. And so I found that really good. Um, let's see if I miss anything else in my notes. Yeah, basically, we need, to rem we need to know that we're clean before we get to verse 4. So, verse 4 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So, this is Jesus saying, look, you need me to survive, okay? If you come to me, I'm going to come to you. We're going to be in this thing together. And you're going to be able to bear fruit. But you can't do it without me, okay? You need me to survive. And so, as I mentioned before, that word remain or other translations say abide means to basically to stay put in Jesus, to hold fast to him, to be um, just wherever he's going, you're going. Like, that's what remain means, unmovable, unshakable, steadfast, like stuck like glue. Okay, that's what I'm getting as a definition of remain means. So, um, let's see, our bodies are the temple of Christ. This is the place where the Holy Spirit dwells. And so God remains in us. How do we treat him? Like if God is a guest, if he's coming to our house, how do you treat your guests that come into your house? Remaining is important to be able to um, have that relationship be, what's the word? Cobiotic? I don't know. Symbiotic? Basically, co-inhabitable. I'm trying to say a word that I don't know, so let me move on from that. <laughs> okay. Um, John, related scripture, John 6 and 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I am them. And this is also um, related to the Lord's Supper. Okay, let's go on to verse 5. <clears throat> I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this is the next step. So this, for some people who may be in the kind of, I got, I got some fruit, you know, this is the next step, having much fruit. Remaining and abiding in him. Verse 5 was pretty much a repeat um, for the remedial saints who missed it in verse 4. Basically, you need the Lord, okay? They stick with him. And you're going places. Um... No, I, I like that this was repeated. Just, re, just the affirmation of encouragement. Okay, like, look, this is I'm giving you the I'm giving you the sauce, right? This is the secret sauce. <laughs> this is what you need to do to move forward. Um, okay. And then I have a related scripture here, John 15 and 16. You do not choose me, I chose you. I'm sorry. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Well, that that right there, that's, that just blesses me right there. I like that one. Okay. So um, verse 6, if you do not remain in me, 
you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. I want to read a parallel verse. Um, I mentioned it earlier. This is my Bible. Psalm 80 and 8. Was it Psalm or Isaiah 1? I mentioned both of them earlier, but one of these I want to read because I felt like this was very related. Because I was wondering, like, why they got to be thrown into the fire, Lord? Like, what's, what's, what's the significance of the fire? Like, why can't they just have been replanted or just kind of tossed to the side? But I, So back, and, and sometimes when I'm praying and I'm, I feel like I'm asking questions, I feel like the answer that I got was, or just remembering the time that they were in, they didn't really have trash cans back then, or they didn't, there was no, you know, vacuum or whatever. And so stuff was burned when it was trying to be disposed of. So the the literal I feel like the literal analogy of burn anytime you see fire in the Bible is usually referring to hell. So I feel like that's what was going on there. Uh, let me find this. this verse Isaiah. I'm really excited about this. Okay. Isaiah 5 is basically the song of the vineyard, and this was referring to Israel. Um, God's chosen nation. So, verse 1, I will sing a song for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked up, then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Okay, so they, they planted some stuff and then they got he got bad result on what he planted. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not done for it, that I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of, the, is, is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah, are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So that's Isaiah um, 5. I, I think the one I really wanted to read was, so that, yeah, I wanted to read Psalm 80. Because it was related to the burn comment that I was asking. Okay. Oh yeah, this is the one. <laughs> okay, so Psalm 80, starting at verse 8 says, You transplanted a vine from Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared out, you cleared the ground for it and took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reach as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it and insects from the field feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from the heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down and it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of the man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And so I guess I was wanting to read this related scripture because it was talking about how in verse, which one was it? 
I just read it. Oh, verse 16. Verse 16 was talking about how it's burned with fire. So, in both um, related scriptures, Isaiah 5 and Psalm 80, both times the the expected result had a consequence of being burned. That's what I was trying to say. That's pretty much what I was trying to say. So going back to John 15, 1 through 8, our, our um, verses that we're doing, verse 6 says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up into the fire, are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And that's pretty much what I was trying to get at. What is that that was burned? <clears throat> okay. Verse 7 says, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What I um, gather when I'm reading this is God is not a genie, okay? He's not someone where you can get whatever you want. You rub your hands three times, clap your hands three times, or whatever, you just get what you want. I think at this point, at verse 7, if you've gone through verses 1 through 6, if you've um, realized that Jesus is divine, and you are the branch, and that apart from him, you can't bear any fruit. Staying in him, being pruned, being cut off, things that need to be cut off, and abiding in him. After all those things, I feel like you can't abide in God and remain in him and not have received what his will is for your life. Like I believe that God confirms in our hearts, and he gives us the desires of his heart so that we can pray them, and then he grants those things he's already said that he wants to do in our life. So um, that's what I... I'm getting when I read verse 7, it says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And there's some other related scriptures that talk about, um, you know, asking you will receive and making sure that, because there are some scriptures that talk about you don't get what you want because you're asking for selfish reasons. But I believe verse 7 is saying, like, after you've gone through the process of being pruned and bearing fruit and then going from some fruit to more fruit and being able to just stick with the Lord, he gives you those desires. He transforms your heart. He gives you a new mind. And then you're walking with him. And then you're wanting the things that he wants. And when you're wanting what God wants, and when you're praying for those things that God wants you to pray for, those things come to pass. Ask whatever you want, and it will be done. Okay. Um, verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So here we go. Disciples, follower of Jesus, someone who wants to be like him. Um, and a related verse is John 8, 31. So he said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you are my, truly my disciples. So the word, all that is needed to abide in God and have your life be transformed to bear fruit okay so the rest of this bible study we'll talk about the different fruits what they look like what they are the definitions of them and um the manifestation of them but i want to kind of set the st the stage or the platform for why we want fruit in our lives why do we want to have that display a jesus said to give um god the glory b fruit is meant to be eaten so as we as believers when we're bearing fruit other people around us are blessed. They should be coming away from your life blessed because of the fruit that you're bearing. Um, so it gives God glory. It's how I can easily, someone can easily identify you if they saw you on the street, like, oh, that's a follower of Christ, you know, like they're exhibiting some type of fruit that is from the Holy Spirit and resembles Christ. Um, so it's very important. And it's to give God glory and to know that you're a true disciple. I believe I believe the fruit of the spirit is important in that aspect. So, producing spiritual fruit comes from spending time with God. If the source is the Word and the Word is God, then get more God in your life. He can transform whatever spiritual fruit area is lacking by addressing your heart. So, thank you for watching. Um, thank you for listening. I pray that you are able to understand more about what God has for your life and the fruit and how to exhibit them and just have a hunger for being with the Lord. Well, I thank you for this Bible study. I thank you for um, just speaking through me, Lord, as we went through the hiccups of me just going through this process. Lord, I thank you for the pruning that you're doing in my own life, Father God. And I just pray that we, um, 
it just gets even greater than this, Lord. From glory to glory, Lord, let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome.